I got an outline for those that are in-house. I apologize. I did not have opportunity to get that up online. I can always email that to you, but I'm gonna, hopefully I'll do this in a way where you get a good outline. I just realized I'm not going to have any uh, slides up either because the sound booth doesn't have my verses. So you'll just have to go along old-fashioned and look up the verses with me as we go. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to pray. We thank you for the answered prayers. Lord, we thank you for, uh, you know, just it's tough to have a, a cyst on your back, but to know that it's not cancer is a blessing. Pray, God, that you just have your hand on these that are in the nursing homes. Pray for Jeremy Bonison's grandmother. Lord, we pray for those that are, uh, thank you for just getting my aunt out of the hospital. And, and uh, Lord, they're still looking at what they need to do to help her. And, uh, but they know, you know, obviously it wasn't fatal. So that's a good thing. And so we praise God for that. Uh, and Lord, we just lift up, um, uh, Lord, these that are on our prayer list. There's a lot of needs that aren't mentioned. There's a lot of needs in our society, Lord. We're praying for our country. Lord, we're praying for the Word of God tonight, even as we teach the Word, Lord, as you, uh, as you teach us all things, whatsoever you've said to us, I pray, God, that you just quicken your Word in a way that connects with our hearts and connects with the world that we live in and help us to be relevant in a time where, uh, Lord, there's a lot of uh, fear and a lot of frustration, a lot of friction. Lord, um, uh, Lord, praise God. It's a great time to be a Christian and to be founded on the rock of Christ. I pray, God, as we look into Ephesians tonight, that you open up our eyes, that we behold wondrous things from your law, Lord, that, that we would uh, really see the grace and liberty that comes through from the Apostle Paul. And Lord, thank you for this uh, time uh, to just uh, come together tonight in your word. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so tonight we're going to hopefully conquer chapter 1 of Ephesians. So I, I took quite a bit of time in verses 1 through 14. And uh, tonight we're going to take, take and go through Ephesians um, uh, verses uh, 15, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And so um, let me make sure. Yeah, I got the right. I'm looking at the title in my notes. I forgot I had the wrong date and verses on there. So I was freaking out for a minute. Amber, you guys are here. Is this your last Wednesday night? Okay, good. All right. I understand that. So I'll, I'll uh, okay, good. I'm glad to know that because I wanted to just at least acknowledge that before you guys roll out the door. So uh, what's that? I know, everybody does. At least you guys are sneaking out in a good way. <laughs> and uh, okay, so we're in the book of Ephesians as I kind of got distracted. For all you guys that are online, uh, forgive me. We're actually doing dual relationships now, in-house and online. So... Um, so we're, we're in the book of Ephesians. Our purpose is still to reveal Christ's efficiency and the church's unity and the Christian's duty, which that's really the outline of the, of the book. Verses 1 and 2 deal with Christ's efficiency. Verses two, uh, 3 and 4 deal with the unity of the body, and, and 5 and 6 deal with our duty. Uh, and so uh, these are part of Paul's prison epistles. The theme here uh, is building the body of Christ in the image and likeness of Christ. And so, uh, you know, when someone dies, and this is something that we've been talking about for several weeks, they leave a will and testament. And so really what Paul's been dealing with in the first 14 verses is that, that will and testament that's written to the saints. And so he's revealing in the book of Ephesians our inheritance. And, um, and so what we've already seen is in, in, uh, in verses 1 through 14 is that he has chosen us in verse 4. He's predestinated us in verse 5, and these are the seven points that we covered the last several weeks. He has accepted us in the beloved in, verses, in verse 6. He's redeemed us in verse 7. He has given us, uh, abounded toward us with wisdom and prudence in verse 8. And then he has made known unto us the mystery of his will. And then the last thing we saw last week is that he has sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise and provided for us the earnest of our inheritance. And so we praise God for that. Um, and so that's a great way to end. As you look at the end of verse 14, let me just have you take your uh, eyeballs and lay it on verse 14, because I want to bounce off of this verse as we go forward. It says, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Now, because if you've been joining us, you know what we're talking about. If you're just picking up on, on this, we know that Christ, the Spirit of God in us, is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. What is the, what is the purchased possession? Us, that's right. And specifically, our bodies are going to be changed and we'll have a glorified body. So that's awesome. 
Uh, and so he ends there talking about unto the praise of his glory. And that's really when I, I want to kind of like jump off of that. You know how you see someone bouncing on the diving board and then they poof, they jump off. So I'm going to jump off of that because that connects us directly to the rest of the chapter. And let me just read through this real quick and then I'm going to go back and go over it. And hopefully I can get all of this done in time before we run out. But it says in verse 14, after he talks about to the praise of his glory, vertical, wherefore I also, Paul, after I heard of your faith, Ephesians, in the Lord Jesus, and love to all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, and that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of his, I'm sorry, of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in the world, but also in that which is to come. And he hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now there's a lot in there. Uh, but when we look at this passage and we, and we look at it, what we see here is that you know, Paul is continuing uh, to, to talk to the, the saints there about you know, this great inheritance. you got the earnest of our inheritance. Therefore, he says in verse 15, uh, once I heard that you guys were legit, right, uh, and you were born again, now I'm going to prayer for you that you kind of know what to do with all this. And then he just goes on extrapolating out the magnitude of that earnest that's inside of us, which is really tremendous. And so I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can to actually get all of these verses in tonight because I think it's important that we, you know, uh, not stretch this out because it really is good to see it all together because it's enormous. We go on for eternity just talking about the last half of this. And so, um, you know, when you stand to inherit something that's meaningful, I mean, substantial, that's a better word, substantial, um, you got to know what to do with it. You know, I just was watching Frank Clark last night. You guys know, how many of you know who Frank, Frank Clark is? Two, two of you. Yeah, the Chiefs, the Frank, yeah, the Frank Clark, Ron. <laughs> yeah, the Chiefs. So you know who I'm talking about. All right. Anybody online know who I'm talking about? I hope so. So, um, uh, so, so Frank Clark, he's got. I thought he said 105 million dollar. He was talking to, to that guy on uh, ESPN. What, what's that guy's name? Skipping. Shannon Sharp. Sh Shannon, not, who's not, I know, Sh I never liked Shannon Sharp until he was on that show, and then I like him. I think he's quite a guy. The Shannon Sharp story is actually outstanding. You should check him out. He came from very humble beginnings. I never liked Shannon Sharp because when he played for the Denver Broncos, him and Ed McCaffrey were just, they would kill us, you know, with, with uh, John Elway. You know, we were just, we were, there's nothing we could do. And, Who's that? Shannon Sharp. Shannon Sharp. Oh, yeah. That guy was amazing. He was really good. So that has nothing to do with the Bible study. Other than this guy, Frank Clark. Um, how did I get to Denver? I don't know. But, oh, Shannon Sharp and the guy that he has a TV show with. Anyway, he's interviewing Frank Clark. And uh, Frank Clark is talking to him. And he, and he says, I got a $105 million contract. So I looked it up today. It's $109 million after five years. Now, uh uh, Frank Clark comes from Bakersfield, California, and based on what I could gather from his own interview and his own testimony, he's probably come from some pretty rough backgrounds uh, coming up, you know, kind of had some trouble. And so, uh, so he, he actually depends upon coach, uh, uh, the coach uh, of the Chiefs to kind of be like a father figure. What's that? Andy, Andy Reid, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're all cooking with gas. You can tell my brain's a little tired today. I need, I need some fuel. So, um, and so, so he's got a, over a hundred million dollar contract that he's got to manage in the next five years. Can you imagine? Now, when you think a hundred million dollars, you're like, <laughs> I can manage it. I can take care of that. No problem. 
I can, I can probably put $20 million right here at HBF just right off the bat and uh, it just go right away. And, uh, but anyway, I would, I would, I got plans. I know what I would do. So, but anyway, so, uh, so, so he, he's got a hundred million dollars and he's got to figure out what to, how to manage that. And that's, you know, you think, oh, that's no big deal, but it is a big deal. Cause once you have a hundred million dollars, it changes everything, right? It changes everything, how you live, how you plan. And really there's a great burden that comes with that. A lot of people who win the lottery, their life goes out of control. And so, you know, spiritually, it's important to, that we pray for people, that they steward their salvation well. Not only does the devil want to, they're not really a threat to the devil until they get saved. That's one spiritual aspect of it. But also, that's what Paul's saying. He goes, now that I know that you guys are saved and, and, and you love the saints and there's evidence of your salvation, I'm praying for you that you really get a hold of all of that, that, that earnest that God has put in you and the magnitude of it. Because because many think the more money you get, the more easy it is. But it really isn't that way. It's not true. Uh, the more uh, the more riches you have, whether it's monetary riches or relational riches or anything, the more you amass of anything of substance, the more responsibility you have. You think you want a mansion until you get one. Now you got to buy, you know, you got to have a mower to, to take care of that that property, right? You got to have somebody clean that huge house and. You know, Amy and I talk about our house is just right for retirement. I'm like, let's build on. Well, let's not build on because then I got to take care of that. Right. So the more you have, the more responsibility you have. So many think that if they just have more money. They'll be OK. But this is what Ecclesiastes 7.11 says. Uh, oh, thank heaven for 7.11. Ecclesiastes 7.11 says wisdom is good with an inheritance and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. So wisdom is good with an inheritance. So the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, uh, and this is Ecclesiastes 7.11, if you're taking notes, Ecclesiastes 7.11. Wisest man that ever lived is Solomon. And, uh, and he says, you know what? If you got an inheritance, it's good to have wisdom. Right? Because if you don't, you're going to lose it. Remember the prodigal son? He got his inheritance early, and then he lost all of it. Why? Because he wasn't fit to keep it. Uh, and he blew it all. In Luke 12, if you got your Bible, look, look over in Luke 12. I'm going to give you a couple passages to look at. I'll flip over there with you. We'll see who wins. Uh, Luke chapter 12. Who's got it? I got it. Okay. <laughs> Amber's got it. I can see it in her eyes. All right. So Luke chapter 12 and verse, uh, and verse 20, 42. This is what, well, I'll start in verse 41. It says, Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or to all? And the Lord, Lord said, Who then is, is that faithful and wise steward? Now, this is going to be important because I'm going to cross-reference you here to a passage dealing with this same word steward called a dispensation. So kind of mark that down in your heart. Who is the Lord? Who, uh, who his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion or meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But he that is a servant, uh, say, but, I'm sorry, but and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and uh, to eat and to drink, and to be drunken, uh, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and he will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and pre uh, pre prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more." So to whom much is given, much is required. And so this issue of stewardship uh, in, in verse 42 of Luke chapter 12 is important. And when you get to verse 48, it says, For to, unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Well, Paul is talking to the Ephesians, and he realizes, and he's just told them, as he's laying out the deity of Christ and how God is in us, Christ in us, it's, it's our earnest of our inheritance. He says, now listen, I'm going to pray for you because you got a lot of responsibility now. You know, sometimes we, you know, I know I do this. I take it easy on disciples. Maybe we should be more forthright and say, listen, you're saved now. 
Your whole world's changing. The way the world's on your shoulders. Not really. Uh, it's all on Christ. But there is a lot to really consider when you think about what God puts in us when we get saved via, via the Holy Ghost. The things that God has given us in Christ are worth more than any riches that we have here on the earth. So there ain't a house that you could own the planet and Christ is worth more than this planet. The person who spoke the not just the planet, but the whole universe into existence lives inside of you. So by comparison, there is no earthly measure by which you can even compare Christ in you. And so Paul's like, guys, I'm telling you, you have the most valuable person in the world, in the universe, living inside of you. So today, with mul- I was just reading some statistics. This is fresh on my mind. Uh, you know, the millennials and the Gen, a- Gen Zers, um, uh, they all have esteem issues because they're comparing themselves. With, they're bombarded constantly with images, uh, most of which are farces. Anyway, they're not true images. So there's a lot of anxiety uh, among uh, younger people and, and concern that they're never perfect, never well, whatever, supposedly, statistically. Well, you know what? That's why they need Christ in them. Because really, your esteem does not come from the exterior when you're a Christian. Now your esteem comes from the interior. It comes from Christ. So the the most valuable person in the world is Jesus, and he's in you. Uh, And he's made you a son, and and, uh, you now have a heavenly father. So that that type of investment requires a great deal of wisdom. right? We've already read from Ecclesiastes, and, and Solomon wrote that passage there about... It's really good if you have an inheritance to have wisdom because you really want to know how to handle those resources. And, uh, you know, he should know what he's talking about because he inherited a ton. You think about King David. When King David came to the throne, Israel was a, was a fledgling nation coming out of the time of Judges, right? And Saul, was a, he, was a, he wasn't a very good leader at all. And David goes from, you know, he's frustrated that the enemies are standing on the, the property, right, that they're you know, out here in the parking lot. And he's like, what in the world? Why are we letting these giants walk around our parking lot? We should get them out of here like Joshua and Caleb. You know, let's get them out of here. You know, and everybody, you know the story. So, so in David's lifetime, he takes the kingdom from the enemies feeling free to roam about the parking lot. Uh, in his case, that was his own property in Judea where they were fighting Goliath. Uh, and he forces them out, not just out of J- Judea, but he forces them out of the whole inheritance of Israel. So by the time Solomon comes to the throne, all the borders are, are secured. And then there's a ring, a buffer. David's been his whole life fighting the enemies of God on the borders and clearing out a space around the nation of Israel, a buffer of, of, uh, of, of security. And so Solomon comes on the throne. Not only does he have a, a peaceful kingdom uh, because David has pretty much wiped out the enemies or made peace with them. Uh, now he also has all the, the financial resources that he needs to build the temple. And he's got all the treasury. that They've already created everything necessary, not just for the tabernacle, but they've prepared what's necessary for the temple, just like they're doing right now, by the way. And so here we are. Solomon has all of this wealth, and he's amassed all of this stuff. And you know what he says? He says, I don't know what in the world I'm doing. I, this is over my head. And God says, that's exactly what I need from you. I need you to understand that what I have blessed you with is over your head. And you need my wisdom. You need my help. So, uh, again, we're going to get to Ephesians. But go back to 1 Kings. And this may be familiar to many of you. But uh, I want you to look at it. And since I I didn't, I apologize for you that are online especially. I did not load up my notes to the sound booth in time. So they do not have the, the verses to throw up there. Now, if you could go to my office, the notes are up there on my computer, but I don't think you're going to do that right now. So um, 1 Kings chapter 3, we can do this the old-fashioned way. Look at verse 7. 1 Kings 3 and verse 7. The Bible says, And now, O Lord my God, 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 7, Thou hast made thy servant king, David, king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. Now, he wasn't really a little child, so he's using hyperbole here. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered or, nor counted for multitude. Now, this is very perceptive on Solomon's part. He doesn't talk about the borders. He doesn't talk about the property. He doesn't talk about the, 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 uh, the, uh, um, you know, the estimated value of the nation of Israel, the gross national product. He says, you know what? There's so many people, I don't know how to handle them. Then he says in verse 9, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. 
For who is able to judge this so great a people? Now, if you look in verse 10, that pleased the Lord. First Kings 3.10. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, saying, this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither uh, after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have given uh, thee that which thou uh, hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like uh, unto thee all thy days." So interestingly enough, he didn't ask for riches and wealth. He asked to be able to steward the people in, in proper justice and judgment. And then God blessed him with all the other things. Because if you, because that tells you something right there. God says, if I can give you wisdom to trust people, then I can, I can also give you, can trust you with wealth. And that's why in the kingdom of God, the, the economy of God's kingdom, we love God and we love people. Now you can be, there used to be a preacher here. I forget his name. Bob Bolkin knew him personally. He was poor his whole life, but he invested all across Cass County. Do you know the guy I'm talking about lived over in Freeman? When I first came down there, he was a faithful jail minister. I, I've heard stories of this guy all over Cass County. He just prayed. There was also uh, the guy that uh, lived during the Civil War. Uh, I don't, he's got a house up here on, uh, on, uh, up by the Wall Street, Abner Dean. That guy through the Civil War, he was imprisoned. Uh, he, he never, uh, you know, he lived in a very difficult situation glorified the Lord, did like a thousand marriages, was a huge, imp he had a huge impact on this part of Missouri in Cass County. Uh, you know, that dude may have never gotten rich physically, but if God can trust a, a man to, to be that much of a minister, you know what, then it's going to, God will take care of him in eternity because the people are much more important than things. God says, look, Solomon, if I can trust you with things or with people, then I can certainly trust you with things. I'm glad you asked for a heart for people because if I can give you that, I can trust you with other stuff. Because you know where the priorities lie. And so that's really what was going on with Solomon. Now, when you think about that, that's exactly the way. When Jesus came, uh, man, he didn't have to shed his blood for the planet. He had to shed, or the universe, he had to shed his, shed his blood for humanity. And he's the one who has esteemed us so highly. So getting back to our text in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul says, I, I'm praising God. I wanna, I'm, you guys are amazing, and you have this inheritance and it's under the praise of His glory. This is all of God's doing. God is doing it. God gets the glory. Uh, so in your outline there, the point one there is pray. The, the title really is, is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. Praise to God uh, leads to prayer for God's people. So one minute, Paul is praising God for what he's done in the lives of the Ephesians. And the next minute, the next verse, two verses later, he's, he's praying to God for the Ephesians. You see how that works? So, so he's praising God in verse 14. And then he says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, right? They had a heart for God's people. When I saw that you understood what was important, you know what? I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. I started praising God for you, and then I started interceding for you. And, uh, and so he started praying for them, which we just started off tonight praying. And so he prays, he talks to the, he, he's, uh, it's under the praise of God's glory. And the next thing you know, he's, he's often offering prayers for them. So point A, give, give them, this is what he's praying, give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's what he says in verse six, 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I, he's like, man, God, God, give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And so we see that Paul's intercessory prayer is, is much like what we see going on in Sol with Solomon. But this time, uh, it's not the Ephesians praying. Paul's praying that they have what, well, we can all get. In James 1, 5, you guys know the verse, If any of you lack, if any of you, of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not. So when we need wisdom, like Solomon needed wisdom, he asked and God gave it to him. Well, so obviously, uh, Paul, Paul, if he lacks wisdom, what's he got to do? Ask. God's gonna, if you lack wisdom, what do you got to do? Ask. I've literally had, like, I've been working on a car or something. One time, 
true story. This is why I will not get done tonight. But one time I'm working on Amy on Amy's the old van that we had, and we just had the windshield replaced, you know. But it didn't occur to me that might be where the problem was. So anyway, uh, when we ran the washer, uh, all this water, the, you know, the windshield washer, all this water would dump out on the ground by the, the driver's tire, I think it was. And so we got all this water hitting the ground. So I'm like, I got to fix this for my bride. So I'm out there and I'm like ready to tear the fender apart. And I'm like, I I'm literally, I'm like getting ready to pull the plastic off and really start digging into this. I'm watching YouTube videos and thinking the pump's broke. I don't know what, I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I just see a bunch of water coming out. And, uh, and I stopped and I said, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you just help me? And it's like, he said, yeah, you need to check up here. And I mean, bada bing, bada boom. Next thing you know, it's, I'm like, it's a super simple fix. And it was because the guy didn't hook a hose up when he replaced the windshield. Uh, and I'm like, man, Lord, thank you. That would have been horrible if I tore apart the fenders. And, <laughs> and then it was something so stupid and simple. So it pays to ask the Lord when you need something, say, God, help me. And he says, I'll give, I'll give, you, I'll give you wisdom. If you lack wisdom, I'll give it to you liberally. I mean, I'm going to give you a lot of it because I want you to have wisdom. But you know what's interesting here? Paul wasn't just concerned about his wisdom. Paul wanted to get his wisdom into the hearts of the Ephesians. Not his wisdom, God's wisdom. He wants, he's like, hey, you know what? I can see you folks are saved. I can see you value people. Solomon valued people. You need wisdom because you know what? If you're going to steward the gospel, you need wisdom. You've got to know how to do it. So in, so in Ephesians, we see Paul going to the Lord in intercessory prayer because he understood the value, the riches of Christ in them. And so uh, another cross-reference, if you're a note-taker under this point, is Isaiah 11:2. 2. The Bible there talks about the Spirit of God in Isaiah 11. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, of course, talking of Jesus, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And so uh, that's that Spirit that, that is in us when we get saved. That's part of the earnest of our inheritance. So we see Paul... Um, he, he wants the Ephesians to receive the same revelation he has. Uh, and and now I, want, I told you to hang on because I took you a minute ago over to um, the New Testament uh, book of Matthew to talk about that steward. You remember I mentioned the word steward. I did that for a reason. Go to Ephesians chapter 3 because we see uh, some other information that's important to why Paul wants them to have this wisdom and then revelation. Wisdom and revelation. So let me give you a little bit more insight here. Now, in Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll talk about this when we get to chapter 3, but I want to mention it right now. It says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, um, if, you had heard, if, you, if you have heard of the dispensation, that word dispensation there is the same word as steward that we saw over in Matthew. If you've heard of, that, of the dispensation or stewardship, of the grace of God, which is given uh, me to you, word, how that by, here it is, revelation, he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. Now that's a little, if you're not reading the Bible every day and you're just kind of breezing across that, it's kind of like over, maybe goes over our head. But when we take time to, to, to really look at that in verse uh, 18 here, um, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 17, Paul says, you know what? Uh, I'm praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So what's he talking about? Well, Paul wants the, his, the, wants the revelation that, that God has given him concerning the dispensation of grace that has been given to us in the church age. He wants that to be given. He wants them to understand that in Ephesus. Especially, you notice he says, for you Gentiles. He's specifically pointing out Gentiles who don't have to be circumcised physically, uh, who don't have to keep the law of Moses, who just have to have Christ because Christ kept the law to fully grasp the benefit of being in Christ. They didn't have to go back and assimilate to the nation of Israel. They had to assimilate to Christ, and they got all of that blessing. And so he says, now I want you to have wisdom and revelation. I, I want you to understand what you have, and I want you to understand what you're a steward of. You're a steward of the dispensation of grace. Now, we're on the tail end of this dispensation of grace right now. And I've been pointing that out to a lot of people. A lot of people are angry and mad. And I just happened to be reading in Revelation. This is where I'm at this week in my daily reading. And 
you know what? It's going to get so bad. You people, you people think it's bad today. Wait until literally Jesus Christ is coming back and people are protesting and rioting against Jesus. <laughs> That's what the Re book of Revelation says is coming. You know, there ain't going to be no stop in the rebellion eventually. And that's why Jesus eventually has to come back. Jesus will come back militarily. He will come back and literally take over the planet because it's going to get that out of hand. Because Satan's literally going to want to, he's literally going to take it over. And that's, what, that's what's happening in the book of Revelation for a season. But then Jesus puts the kibosh on it. It's over. And then uh, it's peace for a thousand years. Praise God. And then we go into eternity future. So that, the story ends very well. But right now, we're at the end of that dispensation of grace. So it's so important that we behave ourselves. The last thing we're going to see in the book of Ephesians is Paul is asking that, interestingly enough, he starts off in chapter 1 praying for the Ephesians, but he concludes chapter 6 saying, would you pray for me? And the thing that he asked the Ephesians to do is pray for him that he would be a good ambassador. Why? Because right now in this age of grace, that's what we are doing. We're, wa we're walking out to the, the, the world that's protesting against Christ and we're saying, listen, hey, listen, I got a deal for you. Uh, we win at the end. <laughs> Jesus wins. He's in charge and he's large. Uh, you cannot get around him. So this is what we're going to offer you. We're going to offer you grace. We're going to offer you an opportunity to bow your knee. You know, right now everybody's going around having people bow their knees. Well, guess what? Here's an opportunity. You can bow your knee right now to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask forgiveness. And you know what? He'll grant it right now. Maybe you're watching tonight and you're like, man, I, I want in on some of that. Hey, call us up, 380-3033. You can email us at contact at hbfcast.org. I'll talk to you more about how you can do that. Um, I see a prayer request, Joelle at ER. Is this a new thing? Okay. Uh, what's she in for? Don't know. We need to be praying for Joelle Arkworthy. So, um, and so, uh, so Paul is like, listen, he wants them to be tuned in and good stewards of God's dispensation of grace because uh, where they live there in Ephesus, you know, the goddess Diana, all that's a great place to offer grace. But also it's, it's important that he is a good ambassador. If he's praying for them, then they'll also turn around and pray for the Apostle Paul. And uh, that's going to continue to advance the kingdom of God. All right, so we'll get into that grace a little more when we get to chapter 2, right? Because Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Which, by the way, chapter 2 is just ideal for where we are in our culture. So it's going to be a good time in Ephesians 2, especially once we get past 8 and 9. Okay, so then, we are, we're, then this is point B, if you've got an outline. Uh, get, so he wants them to have the wisdom and revelation. Then the second thing I have there is, is he's praying. He says, give them the knowledge of God. Now, this is tied into what you see in verse 17. Part of that, that wisdom and revelation is about, he's, he ends the verse there saying, in the knowledge of him. I want them to have the knowledge of him. Uh, and so in Philippians 3, you guys remember this. I'm going to kind of buzz past it. If you're, if, you're, um, if you're a note taker, Philippians 3, verses 8 and 10, that's the passage where Paul says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of, uh, of God by faith, that, verse 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So Paul wanted to know him. And that's really what Paul's saying. I, I want you to know him like I know him. And that's the heart uh, that anybody that has Christ, when you get saved, man, you, not only do you love the saints, but you love the sinners. And you want people to know him the way you know him. Paul's really talking about a value system. He goes, you know what? Everything else is it's like a bowel movement. It's not worth anything. We've fl I flushed my whole life for Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is so much better. And so, so that leads me to the verse 18. This is the third thing. Not only to give him the wisdom and revelation, give him the knowledge of, of God, but also um, I, want you to, I want you to know the knowledge of God's calling. Now notice what he says in verse 18. So once they have this wisdom and revelation, what's going to happen? When the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. There's that word inheritance again, which has been our topic, our, our theme running through the whole first chapter. So give them the knowledge of God's calling. Now, this is an interesting thing to study out, uh, the hope of his calling. In Ephesians Chapter 4, the Bible says, There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called 
in one hope of your calling. Now, this subject of calling can get a little crazy. I, I, there's a lot of times people are talking. I mean, I've had a lot of people ask me, how do you know you're called? Well, you don't know you're called if you don't know God's will. And if you don't know God's word, you don't know God's will. So that's where it needs to start. A lot of times people look for an emotion, a feeling, a sermon that moved them emotionally. So now I'm called to go to Africa, you know, some esoteric thing. Um, I would encourage you all to, to, when you talk about God's calling, start here in Ephesians. Also, you can start in Romans chapter 1 because it's very clear God has called all saints. Just like he calls all men everywhere to repent. God has called everybody in the world to repent. He wants everybody in the world, all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Okay, then after that, he's called all his saints to serve him. There's no doubt about it. Uh, make your calling and election sure. And so the hope of your calling in Christ, what is he talking about? Now, he's talking broadly to the entire church at Ephesus. First of all, of course, we've already noticed that it's Christ in us, right? And he's working through us. Um, and that's, that's the earnest of our inheritance. But I want to run through some verses. So if you're taking notes... Uh, I'll, I'll run these down and uh, we'll look at these. So Paul understood his call to salvation was not separate from his call to service. So his, let me say that twice. His call to salvation wasn't separate from his call to service. What am I saying? When you get saved, you are called to serve. That's all there is to it. You're not called just to be saved, though that's happened sometimes. People just get saved and they get saved and they're going to be naked at the judgment seat of Christ. They, they, they're just saved. Yet by fire. I mean, there's just nothing. But you're, you're saved to serve. If God leaves you here and your heart's beating and your lungs are working, uh, then guess what? He's got a purpose while you're breathing from the moment you get saved to the day you die or get caught up in the rapture. And so you can't separate salvation from service, though many people try. Now, that's, uh, that's ignorant and unlearned, and that's a baby Christian. Uh, but usually a baby Christian even knows that. You don't even have to teach them. I remember Miss Catherine Curtis. I don't know how many of you knew her, but she was one of our early members here at HBF, the original crew there. And she, uh, she was like a crazy woman. And then she got saved and immediately went to work in ministry. Now, I don't recommend that. I, I recommend discipleship, which kind of on-ramps you into ministry because you need to be grounded in the Word. There, you, that can be done faulty. My, my father, as a matter of fact, my, my earthly father, he got, he, he got saved at a, at a revival and then all they did was work him like a mule, you know, drive the bus, build the basement, do all this, do that, you know. And then no one ever invested the word of God in them in discipleship. So that's why I'm big on discipleship to this day, because I don't want to make that same mistake. But I will say this conversely, there's people like Miss Catherine Curtis. She gets saved. She's in the Sunday school the next week and she never turned back. Why? Because she just intuitively understood I'm saved to serve. Now, that's not the best model, by the way. That's how they used to do it in the old days. That's, that's why a lot of people didn't survive, and a lot of teachers didn't know what they were teaching. But uh, she took it seriously. And so, and so where am I going with this? I don't know. Why am I teaching? No, I'm just kidding. Galatians chapter 1, it says this. Paul's in Galatians 1, and be ready for a few verses. He says, but when, I, when, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Oh, wait a minute. What are you talking about? Separate from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Well, first of all, Paul, now Paul was unique in regard to his, his calling, but he was going to serve the Lord one way or another, but he wasn't called until by God's grace until he got saved. But God had a plan for his life. God wanted him to be saved. God wants every man everywhere to be saved. And that's why you're put on the planet. God doesn't, unlike the Calvinist teaching, that God actually has little babies born so he can burn them in eternity. Like that's what he wants to do. That's not what he wants to do. It does happen, but he's working out his bigger purposes with the kingdom. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And it takes nothing away from God's sovereignty, by the way. Um, it, it, it actually deals with man's, man's sovereignty, actually. Man is, has, an, has a, actually his free will is a better way of saying that. There's, and so, uh, so we're counted in this calling. Our calling is covered in Christ's providence. So in 2 Timothy, Paul says this. He says in verse 9, 2 Timothy 1, 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now that may sound like, oh, there you go. See, Brian, you were, you, you were predestined. I, you are predestined in Christ. We covered that in the first part of chapter 1. God has intended for all of us to find our calling in Christ. 
Don't try to serve the Lord outside of being born again. You must be born again. That's why your, your salvation and your service are connected. Our service is no good to God if we're not endued with the Spirit of God. That doesn't mean God, God can use Balaam's ass if he wants to. God will use the, whatever he wants to accomplish his purposes because God is sovereign. I definitely believe in God's sovereignty. Uh, but the reality is, is that God has called those that are serving him to be in Christ before the world began. And so uh, because of that, we have a priestly work as well. First Peter 2 and verse 9 it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That's what we see Paul doing with the Ephesians. He's praying for them. He's interceding for them. Uh, he says, And he's called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Our priesthood, our call to be priests, is found in Christ. It was prepared that way before the foundation of the world. There's no one that's going to intercede to the Father but through the Son. And so, um, and so that's where it's at. So we're also, uh, we're the, this priesthood, but we're also called unto eternal glory in Christ Jesus. In 1 Peter 5.10, the Bible says, But the God of all grace hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So here we have Peter, the apostle of the Jews, and he's saying the same thing uh, uh, Paul is, saying that God, the God of all grace, hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Right? So we definitely, we suffer with him a little while, but we're called to that. God's called us to serve. He's called us to suffer. He's called us to intercede. Uh, he's called us to be separated uh, for his purposes. And he's called us to be part of the body of Christ. Now, again, this ties right back into where Paul's going. Go over to chapter 4, and I'm going to end on this, Lord willing. In chapter 4, in verse, uh, in verse 4, this is a great passage. I'm going to get back to this here in just a minute. But, it, but Paul says, There is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called, and one hope of your calling. So we all have this calling, and it's connected to the body. That's another misnomer today, um, that people can serve the Lord without being connected to the body of Christ. I'm not saying God won't use it, but you're not getting the power. Over and over at the end of chapter 1, Paul's talking about the power, the power, the power, the power, the power, the power. The power's connected to the body, and the body's connected to Christ, and that's how God ordained it. And so you work through the, Christ, you work through the body of Christ if you want the power. First, you've got to be in Christ, and then you work through the body of Christ. But from your salvation, God has called you to serve. So you can know if you're born again, you have a purpose. God has quickened you. Actually, we'll get to Ephesians chapter 2, but a lot of people, we talk about salvation is by grace through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, uh, lest any man should boast. Right? We know that verse. But then in verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has, has a work for us, and he has ordained that that is what we should walk out. That's why later on, when we get to the book of Ephesians, he talks about walking it out, right? Your vocation. You need to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. He's not just talking about going to work every day, though that's a part of it. He has called us to walk out what he has for us in regard to service. So that's tied to this knowledge of our calling. You don't need a big meteorite to come down from heaven and say, you are called to go to the children's ministry. You know what you need? You need the pastor to get up and say, we're hurting like for certain in the children's ministry. That's easy. Go over there and do it <laughs> and then do it. I mean, that's it. that's it. You don't need a special invitation gold letter. You just need to do where the need, go where the need is and watch God bless you. As you bless the body, it's going to bless you and God's going to use it. And you'll have fruit, much fruit and fruit that remains as you minister with people in the body. Okay, time's moving on. So, uh, so get, by the way, another good thing, this last week, we're going to be doing Taking It to the Streets. It looks like we're going to be going, we're going to have a 4th of July outreach. We don't know what the scope of it will be. But uh, man, we just, we went out last week and took it to the streets. Um, and that's a great way just to get involved in ministry. I need, if you don't know nothing, you should show up when we take it to the streets and just go out door to door. It's a great time. So I want to thank Pat Lee and all those that showed up Saturday and did that. That was a good time. We had fun. All right. So, all right. Point D, give them knowledge of God's riches. That's the next thing we see in verse 18. Paul goes on and he says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Uh, what is, I'm sorry, what the riches, no, I said that right. What and what 
the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And so what's God doing in the saints? What about those riches? Riches is the blank there. This is a a particularly hard thing for people in our generation to get a hold of and comprehend where the true riches are. Uh, And that's why it's going to get increasingly worse as times as if, if we don't disciple. And, uh, and so we know Revelation chapter 3. You guys know that passage. That's what Jesus is saying. Because thou sayest thou art rich. The problem isn't that we are rich. It's that we think we're rich. We have value on the wrong things. You know, if you look at Solomon, you can say, oh, he is rich because he had gold-plated stuff ready to go in the temple and he had everything paid for in the treasury so he could build a temple. That's not what made him rich. What made him rich was people. And, uh, and so, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. You know the danger of the Laodicea is that we have a relationship with Jesus like you have with everybody else on Facebook. I like got 3,000 friends on Facebook. And by the way, I'm glad you're watching. Praise God. But the reality is I don't know everybody very well on my Facebook. I don't know. I mean, do you guys know all your friends on Facebook closely? I know you folks. You're in the room. We're face to face. Well, people are, are going to continue to have a superficial relationship with Jesus Christ. And they're going to break their arm patting themselves on the back about how many Bible studies, how many tick marks they got on the online Bible program, how many Bible studies they went through, how much knowledge they've amassed. But we know the knowledge puffeth up, charity edifies. And if it's not going into people, well, then you're wasting your time. You think you're rich and increase with goods, but it, the reality is you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You're relationally retarded. And so, man, investing in people is investing in eternity. That is the true riches. And so investing in eternity is what what blesses God's kingdom. Now listen to this, because it does have a monetary value as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, turn over there real quick, and I'm I'm almost done. So I think I'm going to make it. I think I can make it. There used to be a song like that. I'm going to be a little over, but not bad. One more time. I don't know. Anyway. All right. Where am I saying? 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6. Paul is uh, writing to his son in the Lord. He says in verse 17, giving us some pastoral guidance. He says, charge them that are rich in this world. Now he's talking about money. That they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, which giveth richly all things to enjoy. The, what, what, makes, what makes people important is Jesus being in people, Christ in them, the hope of glory. The true riches is Jesus. And he says, hey, charge those that are wealthy, that, like have financial gain, not to get too caught up in that, because you know what? That's not the true riches. He goes on to say in verse 18 that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, ready to give, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So what he's saying is that you can be rich in this world and have all and suffer all kinds of loss in eternity. He's like, you better be laying something up in eternity so you don't suffer loss when you get to the judgment seat of Christ. You better lay that stuff up. And so what are we putting on the foundation of Christ? Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble? You know, we need to invest in people, uh, not things. So we are all wealthy, by the way, financially in, in a world standard, even in this room. I mean, when you consider, consider once you travel around the world, you realize, whoa, Right? Yeah, you've been to you've been where you've been to India, and you've been to Mexico. You live in Guatemala. You've traveled the world. Have you been out of the country? Right. So all of us in here, almost, have been in places where we realize, whoa. Now we shouldn't feel guilty, but we ought to understand that. Well, you know what? First um, Timothy six does apply to us, and so we do need to be. Uh, it's, it's, it applies to everybody, even if you're in Arissa. Maybe you're watching in Arissa right now or listening. You know what? You may not feel like you have a lot monetarily, but even if you have some rice, you got more rice than somebody else, bring a, a, bring a tithe of rice to the church, and, and God will bless that thing because there's somebody in your church that needs some rice, right? And so that's how God blesses, and he uses those monetary things to bless other people. All right, so I've got to finish this up. Here's my last point, verses 19 through 23. Let's chew these up. Uh, and so give them knowledge of God's power. I mentioned this already, so... 
uh, let me just wrap up with the power passage here at the end. This, he's praying for their power. He says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, uh, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. What? Which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So he connects all this power to the body of Christ. And, and what comprises the body of Christ? Not the building, but the people that are in it. You got the power, right? So Jesus is our power, is what he says in verse 19, right? The power to usward. Well, that's the earnest of the inheritance. It's in us. We got the power. power that's what Jesus said. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore teach all nations. And then he tells them, wait, Acts 1.8, wait till the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall receive power once the Holy Ghost comes upon you. When you get the Spirit of God in you, you got the power. When you bring that together in the body, it's plugged in and it's connected and it's like energized. And then now, the power that's coming to us is going out. And that's what Paul's praying. He's like, oh, Ephesians, please steward your power well. You have all power. You have Christ in you. You got what you need. Also, you got Jesus' authority as a result of God's power. God's power did the work to resurrect. It says it wrought in verse 20. Check that out. He says, which is wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. This power is powerful enough to, to do the work of raising Christ from the dead and setting him at his own right hand in heavenly places. That's the same power that's going to resurrect us and set us in heavenly places. The same power that's worked in Christ is, guess what? It's working in us. That's huge, man. That's powerful. It's working in us individually because of the earnest of the Spirit and collectively. God is not only going to resurrect me, and He will, but He was also, if I die before the rapture, He's also going to resurrect all of us that are in the body of Christ because He fills all in all, okay? And so He goes on to say that Jesus is the person of power in verse 21, far above all principality and power. So right now there's a lot of people on a power trip. I don't care if you're left, right, in the middle, fascist, Marxist, whatever. There's all of that's running around all over the news and media. Listen, it doesn't matter what your power trip is. Jesus is the ultimate power. He is the authority. He is far above all principality and power. And so, you know what? I am not going to bow for anybody but Jesus. I've already made up my mind. <laughs> I am not doing that. Jesus is the one we bow to. And he is our power above all principality and power and might and dominion. And, the, and every name that is, is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So you remember Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They would not bow to the most powerful man on the planet. That man being Nebuchadnezzar. And they, did not burn. And they didn't burn, did they? That's right. They were able to get through the fire, literally. And so, man, what an incredible testimony that was. Make sure you understand, when you bowed your knee and trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know what, I, when I got up off the ground, I felt empowered because I was empowered. Jesus Christ, whether you feel it or not, when you get saved, He empowers you. And so, that's why, by the way, it's, it's good sometimes. You know, it's not wrong. To, I sat here and prayed a minute ago. I bowed my head and... It's, you can pray standing up. You can pray laying down. You can pray upside down on your head. I don't care how you pray. But every once in a while, it is good just to stop and bow or even lay down flat before the Lord and pray and just submission to Him. Not that your body has to be in that mode. You're, you know, we're, we're not about asceticism. You're not earning any favor with God because of your bodily position. But sometimes it does me some good just to take a knee and bow before the Lord and acknowledge you got the power, man, and I'm coming before you humbly. But anyway, look at verse 22, because i got to get done here quickly. Far above all principality and power. We talked about that in verse 21, verse 22. And hath put all things under his feet, everything's under him, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. What? Yeah, he's going to give us authority over all things because we're his bride. 
It's beautiful. And he'll get to that in chapter 5. And he unwraps that mystery. Right? The revelation that he's talking about here, he unwraps it and says, And by the way, church, you are the bride of Christ. Marriage is just a picture of the power that you have in Christ. Jesus is the authoritative power over all things in verse 22. And Jesus is the fullness of power in time and eternity. And so verse 23 wraps up. He says, Which is his body, the church, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Your inheritance is so incredible that his inheritance is your inheritance. You have inherited all things because you have all things when you are in Christ. And that, my friends, is eternal. And that is because Jesus Christ isn't a Christ. He's the Christ and he is Messiah. He is God. And so Ephesians chapter four, verses one through six, we'll get to this later. But he says this, he says, you know what? There's one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. That's the kind of power you have in Christ. And that's why Paul says, you know what, I am so thankful you're saved, but I'm going to pray that you know how to handle that gift that God's given you, that power. So you steward that well, because it's, you think, you know, Frank Clark thinks he got a, something because he got over $100 million in contract. That's tiddlywinks compared to what you get when you're in Christ. The power, the love, the sound mind, the things that God blesses us with, the promises that he has, it cannot be compared to the things. That's why Paul says, I count all this stuff, but dung that I may win Christ. Because, man, I tell you what, the inheritance that we have in Christ is, is, is amazing. It's eternal. It's, it, to use a word that should be more lightly used, it's awesome. And so uh, Paul understands that. He's like, you know, I see the fruit of Christ in them. I'm praying for their stewardship. I'm praying, I'm praying for them that they understand who Christ is. They understand uh, what their calling is. They understand what, what God wants to do in their life. And, uh, and all the points I just forgot. So let me run through those one more time. I'm praying that they understand the wisdom and revelation. I pray that they understand uh, God's knowledge. I pray that they understand their calling. I pray that they understand the power. And uh, that's my point. So praise God. Let's have a word of prayer. Are there any questions, by the way, before we wrap it up? COVID. Oh, really? Yeah, if you're watching, because they can't hear you, Sharon. Sharon is pointing out uh, that Mumbai, she heard on the news, has a very large case load of the COVID uh, coronavirus. So uh, be in prayer for our friends in Mumbai. And they do not have the health infrastructure either. So if someone were to have a respiratory issue and needed help, they're going to have a harder time finding that yeah, in Mumbai. And life is cheap in that culture. So they're fatalistic to start with. So uh, they don't have the same care for humans that we have. So be in prayer for all of our friends like Ganesh and all those. And, and, uh, and by the way, since you mentioned Mumbai a few weeks ago, uh, be praying for that church, the, the, the Greater Grace Church over there. Pastor Carl Silva passed away. And so, uh, you know, he left at a really weird time in history, you know, and so they got about five pastors handling the church there. So pray they work out all the, the needs that they have for that city and that ministry. It's a big ministry. And so, um, and remember Joella Larkworthy, she's in, uh, she is in uh, ER at St. Luke's, I think it said. And so be in prayer for her. Anything else uh, coming in on the lines there, Raymond, as we wrap it up? No. We're losing internet. Really? Huh. Because I put it out, I put it out longer so that we wouldn't lose internet. Because uh, some sometimes we lose it because I don't have... I am optimistic about being done on time. All right, so let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we will be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for uh, this time to consider what we have in Christ, and thank you for the prayer, not only that what Paul was offering for the Ephesians, uh, but also for us. Lord, thank you for, I don't really, I'm here teaching all this, but I, I really don't fully grasp um, the magnitude of the inheritance. And, and I'm like Solomon, I just pray, God, you give us, Give us grace and wisdom to, to be able to be good stewards of people. 
Lord, help us as Christians, especially not to be narcissistic about our salvation and make it all about us. Lord, help us to realize that you give us this power. You give us this gift so that we can serve you and, and give it to others. As Paul was quick to pray for others and encourage others and want to give them what he had, which is the knowledge of the mystery of Christ. And uh, Lord, what an incredible picture it's found in Christ in the church. What a beautiful thing. So Father, we just thank you and praise you tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us all things in Christ and, and Lord, giving us this opportunity to steward them in time. Lord, I pray, God, you just bless us. Forgive us where we fail you. Lord, help us, our hearts to be pure before you. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.